In 1946, the American twin city of Texarkana was plunged into the depths of panic and fear. The population of the post-war suburb was subjected to a series of murders that shook the jewel cities to their core, prompting curfews, rumours and unease to spread through the area, like the rail tracks that crept from its central hub. Nights of midnight movies, driving cafes, the songs of Duke Ellington and big band orchestras were perforated with tales of a man with a white sheet over his head, holes cut out for eyes, performing brutal executions upon the vulnerable and unexpecting. The case would later be loosely retold in horror films, linked with urban legends and dubbed the number one unsolved murder case in Texas history. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Welcome to Dark Histories, Season 2, Episode 20, Part 1. Yeah, Part 1, because this is going to be a two-part episode. I'm going to release both parts exactly the same time, so there's no waiting or cliffhangers or anything. I've split it into two just purely because it's the length of this one and the kind of it's quite dense with a lot of information, so I just thought it would be easier to digest a little bit um, for commuters, things like that, to split it into two. So that's, that's that explained. With that said, we're going to do this really quick. Thanks very much to our newest Patreon members, uh, especially this episode. It, you know, the support is really helpful because almost all of the best sources for uh, this story were either physical or behind a paywall. So, you know, I really appreciate your support all the time from all the patrons, but with this episode especially, I could afford to, you know, get those better sources, those sort of primary sources in a lot of cases purely because you know the patron money so thanks very much i really appreciate it and newest patrons dom deirdre david kyle marianne Catherine, kelly mark carl reese juju dion and a name i can't pronounce dirty darthy thank you very much sorry for mispronouncing your name and talking about mispronunciations i will say now i know that tex arcana is Texarkana, if you're American, but I thought I would sound like a moron if I kept speaking with a British accent and then suddenly switching up to Texarkana to say Texarkana. So that's how I'm going to, I'm just going to roll with Texarkana and I apologise profusely for that. It's, it's not a matter of not knowing how to pronounce Texarkana, it's just not being American comes across as Texarkana. So I apologize profusely to all americans especially those from texarkana <laughs> anyway let's get on with the episode uh this is what, what did i call this the phantom texarkana moonlight murders founded in 1873 texarkana was a strange place to lay down a town Spilling over the state line of Texas and Arkansas, half of the town lies in one state and half in the other. On the Texas side, it resides in Bowie County, the Arkansas side, Miller County. The area for the most part operates as two separate cities, with each half having their own mayors, police force, and each with its own governing bodies, though they cooperatively share many utilities and a federal building, which sits centrally straddling the two states, making it the only federal building in America to occupy more than one state. It's built in the centre of the aptly named State Line Avenue, the city's central street which snakes through the middle of the region, marking the division between Texas and Arkansas. Hundreds of years before its founding, Texarkana lay on the Great Southwestern Trail, a Native American route that ran from the Mississippi River to the southwest, and after its founding, the city continued this tradition with a railway junction connecting it with nine railroad systems. It was known as the gateway to the southwest and had the rough and ready reputation of any good frontier boomtown. In 1888, 21 saloons were listed in Texarkana and it had its fair share of gambling dens and brothels too, with local law enforcement taking an out of sight, out of mind mentality. Besides, the sheriff himself had a taste for illegal gambling and ran much of the network either through laws of his own making or through underhand deals that cut him in on the profits. Sheriff Dixon, as he was known, was not a man to be crossed. Other established 
when one gambling hall owner wouldn't cooperate with Dixon's shady dealings, he had his establishment raided, the man arrested and tried where he shot him dead in the middle of the courthouse before calmly walking out to continue his duties as sheriff and local boss. That was until 1894 when Dixon met his maker after an argument with another establishment owner, one Albert Johnson, who promptly went home to collect his shotgun, returning only to blow the sheriff's head off as he stood outside his saloon in what was deemed justifiable homicide. On the turn of the 20th century, Texarkana boasted a population of 14,000, city status, a waterworks and streetcar system, two foundries, a machine shop, schools and a hotel all fueled by its timber and agricultural economy. By the 1930s, the Great Depression had hit Texarkana and whilst 146 of its 800 businesses had been forced to close, the Second World War buoyed its economy with the arrival of both the Red River Army Depot and the Lone Star Army Ammunition Plant taking residence in the city, over doubling its population to 53,000 and offering jobs and housing for thousands in the local area. The small city of Texarkana grew bigger and did so quickly, leaving behind much of its small town lifestyle. Texarkana's railroads continued to be a strategic advantage for industry and crime alike. The rails brought in big business, politicians and industry, but also drifters, strangers and oftentimes criminals. It became known locally as Little Chicago. Bar brawls broke out on the regular and during Prohibition it was central in the line of running illegal alcohol across its nearby borders and bootleggers passed through the town almost daily. In any of the numerous clubs and dance halls, nobody paid much mind to what might have been in another's cup. By 1946, Texarkana had shaken much of its earlier frontier roots. Servicemen were returning from the war and people were looking forward in life. Weekends consisted of going to one of several theatres to catch a movie, one of the largest being the Paramount, as well as driving cafes, clubs and bars that operated on brown bag policy. You could only buy beer on the premises, but you could bring in liquor as long as it was concealed, which most chose to do with brown paper bags. Black and white movies still played at midnight, and jazz and big band groups played late into the night and following morning. Whilst it did have its share of violence and crime, Texarkana existed in a state of duality. Brothels, bar fights, teenage drinking and violent crime existed on one hand, and on the other, it was an idyllic post-war suburb with unlocked doors and strong community. It was, it seems, a town split in more ways than one. James Mack Jimmy Hollis was born on September 5, 1920 in Dubac, Louisiana. He had two brothers, Edmund and Bob Hollis, and two sisters. Just a few months following his birth, his parents decided to up sticks and move to El Dorado, Arkansas to open a general store and restaurant. They later moved again to California, where Jimmy attended high school. After his graduation, and with the outbreak of the Second World War, Jimmy attempted to follow in his elder brother's footsteps by enlisting in the services. However, he failed the Navy physical examination due to a congenital heart defect. Instead, he did the next best thing that he could think of, and he took a job manufacturing aircraft in Fort Worth, Texas. He was a likeable guy and he sang in a dance band. At the age of 21, he settled down to marry 19-year-old Dora Louise Nichols in December of 1942. The marriage was not to last, however, and after a mutual separation in 1946, aged 25, he left Fort Worth and joined up with his older brother Edmund in Texarkana on the Arkansas side. Edmund was working as a manager of an insurance company and had recently employed their brother Bob as an insurance agent after he had returned from serving in the war. Edmund offered Jimmy the same deal and seeing the opportunity to regain his feet after his separation, he took it gratefully and moved in with Bob. On Friday the 22nd of February, Jimmy was getting ready to go on a double date with his brother Bob and Virginia Fairchild. He'd been taking a young lady he'd only met earlier that month, Mary Jean Leary, who at 19 years old was six years his junior, but was also going through a recent separation. The pair had found themselves in a similar position and they'd hit it off immediately. 
Mary Jean Larry was 19 years old, having been born in 1927 in Tishomingo, Oklahoma. But with the incoming industry boom at the onset of war, she moved to Texas with her mother and father who had taken a job in the Red River Ordnance Depot, which ammunition storage facility 15 miles west of Texarkana. Hooks was a small town consisting of government housing for workers of the depot that nestled on the northern edge of the facility, about a 20 minute drive from central Texarkana. She attended high school in Hooks and in 1943 at the age of 16 married Roland Larry changing her age on her marriage certificate to 18 so as to avoid any need for her parents' consent. Shortly after their marriage, Larry joined the Navy and went off to war, and by the time he had returned home in 1946, the couple decided that it would be best if they were separated. The marriage had been one of many thousands of wartime spontaneity or thrillerity that just hadn't worked out. Their separation was mutual and it was made official in January of 1946. At 10.15pm, Mary Jean, Jimmy, Virginia Lorraine and Bob left the Paramount Theatre where they'd gone to see Three Strangers, a recent film noir thriller release set in London, England. Not wanting to call it a night, Jimmy drove the group in his old model grey Chevrolet to an all-night drive-in cafe. After a late night drink, Jimmy drove Bob and Virginia Lorraine home and then returned on to Richmond Road it would take the couple northeast out of the city to drive Mary Jean home to Hooks. It was only 11pm, still a little early for a Friday night, so instead of driving Mary Jean straight home, the couple decided instead to detour onto a dirt road that sprung from Richmond and parked up in a small lay-by surrounded by shrubland. It was pitch black out there on the dirt track, city lights, but more importantly, it was peaceful and quiet. There were several of these lanes around Texarkana, known as Lover's Lanes, and it was common practice at the time to head out and park up late at night for a little privacy, a place you could be alone with your date. The problem for Jimmy and Mary Jean, however, was that they weren't alone. Months later, Mary Jean told the story to the Texarkana Gazette. We had been there about 10 minutes when a man walked up. He wore a white mask over his head with cut out places for his eyes and mouth. He pointed a flashlight and pistol at us. He came up on the driver's side of the car and he told Jimmy something like this. I don't want to kill you fellow, so do what I say. We both got out of the car on Jimmy's side and stood by the man. The man then told Jimmy, take off your fucking britches. Mary Jean, scared, begged Jimmy to go along with the man's strange request in the hope that they could get out of the situation unhurt. Though the beam from the flashlight shone in their eyes, they could tell he was fairly tall and he didn't sound like an old man, the glint of the pistol barrel reflected in the beam. Jimmy unbuckled his pants and let them fall to the floor around his ankles. After Jimmy had taken off his trousers, the man hit Jimmy twice on the head. The noise was so loud I thought Jimmy had been shot. I learned later that the sound was his skull cracking. I picked up Jimmy's pants and took his billfold out of his pocket and I said, look, he doesn't have any money. But the man told me I was lying and he said that I had a purse, but I told him that I didn't. Then he hit me, I thought with a piece of iron pipe and it knocked me to the ground, but I managed to get up. The man then told Mary Jean to take off. In a blind panic, she made towards a ditch before the voice rung out into the night again, yelling at her, telling her to change direction. She ran instead back towards the main road. Her heels made it difficult on the dirt road, but she had spotted another car parked up. She headed straight for it, but as she drew nearer, she noticed there was no one inside. In her panic, she had not stopped to think it might have belonged to the attacker. She started to run again. Just as I got past the car, the man overtook me. The attacker hit her again on the head, knocking her to the floor, and attempted to sexually assault her with the barrel of his gun. As quickly as it had begun, however, the horror had stopped. The man had quickly got up from Mary Jean and left, possibly scared away by the headlights of a passing car. Mary Jean pulled herself up from the ground and ran to the first house she could see on Richmond Road. Whilst this had been going on, Jimmy had also picked himself up from the ground. 
beaten, bloody, with no glasses and his skull fractured in three places, he stumbled onto Richmond Road and flagged down a passing car. The car pulled over and was occupied by a man and woman who looked terrified at the sight of Jimmy's beaten figure, ambling out of the dark. The driver refused to let Jimmy inside the car, but promised he would call an ambulance for him at the first opportunity. As it turned out, it was unnecessary, as at that point, the emergency services, a police car and ambulance had arrived on the scene, alerted earlier by Mary Jean. The ambulance took Jimmy to Texarkana Hospital, followed by Mary Jean in the police car. Mary Jean's head needed eight stitches, but she had, physically at least, come away in a better state than Jimmy, who lay in a coma in intensive care. Police estimated the whole attack to have taken between just five and eight minutes, with the attacker taking, at most, $20. The investigation into who the attacker may have been began almost immediately. Police tracked the scene and found Jimmy's pants, but little else. Mary Jean was questioned in the hospital, where she told police that she had never seen or heard the man before, but that he had been wearing a white mask with holes cut out for eyes. She thought he might have been a black man based on his speech, but due to shock, her account was shaky at best. The police certainly didn't give it much credence, and they thought that it was incomplete. They were guessing that she'd known more than she was letting on, and had invented the mask as a way to hide information for fear of reprisal. In the afternoon edition of the Daily News on the next day, Saturday the 23rd, the headline read, Masked man beats Texarkanian and girl. Attack occurs on road where couple parked. With little for the police to go on, they first suspected Mary Jean's ex-husband. Jimmy's brothers had assured police that he had no enemies to speak of and that his recent divorce had been a mutual agreement and carried out with civility. After they found the same had applied in Mary Jean's divorce, and even more critically, that her ex-husband had an alibi that checked out, they found themselves back at square one. Once Jimmy came out of his coma, they placed a 24-hour guard on his room for the 15 days he was kept in for recovery. When he was finally allowed home, Bowie County Sheriff William Presley, the officer who arrived first on the scene on the night of the attack, visited him to question him on the identity of the perpetrator. Jimmy couldn't help the police much more than Mary Jean. He'd been unable to see much of anything due to being blinded by the flashlight. However, he did tell the police, I think he's a white man, not over 30 years old and desperate. That man is dangerous. He's a potential murderer. The next one he gets will be killed. Evidently, he thought he'd killed me that night. I know he was crazy, the crazy things he said, I know his mind was warped. The discrepancies between the couple's statements caused problems for police. They now believe stronger than ever that Mary Jean was possibly holding back information and that the mask had been a fictional detail. Moreover, the description given by Jimmy was so vague that it simply opened up the list of potential suspects to thousands of young men in Texarkana alone. On March the 20th, Texas Ranger Stuart Stanley visited Jimmy for further questioning, but no new details were forthcoming. The police had precious few details and no obvious motive for the violent crime. He had taken no more than $20 and he hadn't seemed interested in robbing them in the first place. He had sexually assaulted Mary Jean with his pistol, but not raped her. Who was the man and what exactly had driven him to commit such violence upon two unsuspecting and entirely inoffensive and indistinguishable young people. The question was turned over again and again, each time drawing a blank. Richard Griffin was a 29-year-old World War II veteran who had recently returned to Texarkana after serving in the Navy Construction Battalion in the Pacific. He was born on August 31, 1916. He was the eldest of five children, with two sisters and two brothers. He had schooled in Linden, Texas, and his family worked a cotton farm. They were devout Methodists, attending church every Sunday. Richard had been a carpenter and worked as an independent contractor before the war, and had gained a contract in Hawaii repairing warships. This led him to join the Navy in 1942, where he joined the Seabees, constructing naval bases in the Pacific. In 1943, whilst he was serving, his father died unexpectedly and Richard, stuck in the middle of a gruelling war zone, 
was unable to attend the funeral. His mother, Bernice, moved in with her daughter, Eleanor, in Texarkana following their father's death. Like many Texarkanians, about 12,000 to be exact, Eleanor was working at the Lone Star Army ammunition plant and the family lived in Robertson Courts, a government wartime housing district. After his service and the war was ended, Richard moved into the family home, but he took on a carpentry job over 40 miles away. Rather than commute, he worked Monday through Friday away from Texarkana and stayed with his family at the weekends. In February of 1946, he met and began dating Polly Ann Moore, a headstrong 17-year-old from nearby Cass County. Polly Ann Moore was born on November 10th, 1928, and she'd attended high school in Atlanta, Texas. She had one brother named Mark and lived with her mother Lizzie. Her father had died from a stroke when she was just eight years old. She graduated in 1945 and went off to work in the Red River Ordnance Depot as an ammunition checker, maintaining records and inventory. Due to the commute, she rented a room in her mother's cousin's house in Texarkana on the Texas side, where she had met Richard Griffin. The couple had only dated for six weeks, but were getting along real fine. The 12 year age gap was not such a big deal at the time, and Polly was confident and mature for her age. On Saturday the 23rd of March, Richard picked up Polly in his slightly road-worn 1941 Oldsmobile sedan from her house on Magnolia Street, one street over on the Texas side of State Line Avenue. The couple had planned a double date with Richard's sister Eleanor and her boyfriend at the Canary Cottage, a diner that specialised in chicken and steak. They had planned to go for dinner, then onto a movie at the Paramount. During the meal, Polly spilt some food on her blouse so after they had finished, the double date split up, with Richard driving Polly back to her house to change her clothes, and then they went as arranged to the Paramount to watch a showing of the 1945 release Snafu, a comedic take on a military film set in the Pacific Theatre during World War II. After the film, they went to a cafe and wound down the evening until 2am, where they called it a night and took off in the direction of home. Richard and Polly drove down West 7th, one of the main arteries that runs from central Texarkana, slightly leaning southwest to the city boundary. Given the fact that they were travelling in the opposite direction of either of the couple's home, it's likely that their pulling over at a lover's lane just south from the highway, known as Rich Road, was a premeditated end to the evening. They parked up in an empty parking spot and the silence of the night fell upon the old Chevy. They weren't alone for long, however, as another car pulled up by the parking spot. As the light shut off, Richard and Polly paid it little mind. That was until their privacy was once again interrupted, this time by a man standing at the window of the car who told Richard to drop his pants. As the sun peaked above the horizon, a light rain fell across Texarkana. That Sunday morning saw little traffic on the roads. At around 9am, a man driving along the lane from West 7th saw Richard's grey Chevy and thought something about it seemed suspicious. He didn't stop to check it out. Instead, he decided to call it into the police and go on his way. It was probably lucky he did so, as when the officers in the squad car dispatched to check the call out arrived, they found a scene that would have given him nightmares for years. The body of Richard Griffin sat in the well between the two front seats slumping forward. His pants were around his ankles and his pockets had been turned out. He had been shot twice in the back of the head whilst he'd been in the car. Polly's body lay on the back seat, also shot twice in the back of the head. By the time Sheriff Presley and Arkansas State Trooper Max Tackett arrived on the scene, a crowd had gathered and worse, no efforts had been made to protect the crime scene from outside interference. Police deduced from a large blood-soaked stain on the ground 20 feet from the car that Polly had been shot outside of the car and then placed in after she had bled out onto the blanket. The police figured from the amount of blood on the scene and inside the car that the killer must have been covered, though the earlier rain and the bustling crowd on the scene had laid waste to any idea of following a track that may have been left by the killer. Presley contacted the rangers, though there was little hope of discovering much else at the scene. They managed to obtain an ID for the man's body and confirmed it to be that of Richard Griffin from his driver's license in his wallet. 
The woman's ID was a little more difficult, but after discovering she was wearing an Atlanta High Class of 45 ring with the initials PAM etched on the inside of the band, the sheriff contacted the Atlanta City Marshal, who confirmed with the school that the body was that of Polly Ann Moore. An onlooker who had been scouring the ground around the car found the ignition keys stomped into the ground 50 yards from the vehicle and he handed them into Presley. Later in the day, the car was removed and taken to the station for fingerprinting, though by the time it arrived, it had been manhandled both at the scene by the numerous onlookers and by the removal process that it would turn out to be next to useless. Richard's elder brother, Wellborn, confirmed the car belonged to Richard and later that evening, he ID'd the body of Richard himself in the city hospital. The onlookers had a secondary effect on the case. Quite outside of potentially destroying important evidence or clues, they also fostered rumours and hearsay as they spoke amongst themselves, deducing what each thought might have happened. A rumour quickly spread that Polly had been sexually assaulted and it persisted for many years after the killings. However, the physician that carried out the examination of her body officially remarked that there had been no evidence that a rape or assault had been carried out. The following Monday, the 25th of March, the Texarkana Gazette ran with the story as the main headline. Couple found shot to death in auto. The investigation into the double murder of Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore proceeded slowly. The police had almost nothing to go on in terms of hard facts. On Monday evening, Texas Ranger Jimmy Gear arrived to examine the body of Richard. Polly had, by now, already been buried, and the Ranger was not best pleased with how the entire event had been handled. He scolded the police for not protecting the crime scene and for burying Polly before removing bullets from her body. Instead, he arranged for the two bullets to be removed from Richard's head. Outside of this, all were left perplexed by the killer's motive, or rather, lack thereof. No robbery appeared to have taken place, or at least a small sum of money had been found still in Richard's wallet, and no sexual assault or other sexual motive appeared to present itself. The whole affair appeared to have been a mindless execution. With a lack of rhyme or reason justified or not, panic will begin to spread, and so it did in Texarkana. The deaths of the couple were officially written up as deaths at the hand of an unknown person for unknown reasons. Analysis of the bullets removed from Richard's body did give the police some clues, chiefly that they were a 32 caliber shell shot from an automatic or semi-automatic pistol. Most likely it was an American-made Colt. The problem with this analysis, however, was the commonality of the firearm. Ranger Gear searched the scene for a further two days before accepting defeat with no results, whilst a $500 reward was posted for information regarding the crime a sum equal to about $6,000 today. Within four days of the killings, over 50 people were questioned and over 100 leads were followed, but all led nowhere. Three suspects were arrested on the basis that they were found in possession of bloody clothing, but all had been checked over and released. In the following weeks, police would tirelessly track over another 100 false leads, each one leading to a dead end. When Mary Jean Larry heard of the rumours, she drove from her new home in Frederick, Oklahoma, where she had moved after the early attack on her and Jimmy, to insist to police that she was sure the attack she had endured was linked. The police, however, found little stock in the story, and since they found her earlier testimony to be unreliable in their book, they wrote it off without much thought to the fact that the two attacks showed several distinct similarities. Days and then weeks passed with little to no progress made on the investigation. Frustration and rumour grew, but there was little that could be done. Life in Texarkana continued at a normal pace, with nothing out of the ordinary occurring, just an added, salacious story to do the rounds in quiet talk and local gossip. On Saturday the 13th of April, local band Jerry Atkins and his rhythm airs were winding down a gig at the local Veterans of Foreign Wars Club. They played there regularly to a lively dance crowd, knocking out Duke Ellington and Glenn Miller classics in the upbeat big band theme of the time. The leader of the band, Jerry Atkins, had taken control of the group after the onset of World War II due to the shortage of players. He rebuilt it with several younger members, one of which was local sax player Betty Jo Booker. 
Betty Jo was 15 years old and she attended Texas High School. She was born on June 5th, 1930, but lost her father at the age of three to a fatal road accident. Despite this, she had a lively and vibrant childhood, interested in singing and dancing. She won Miss Tiny Texarkana in 1933, less than a year after her father's passing. She had an older brother, though he had been born with brain damage. Their mother Bessie Booker did her best to support the family alone and she idolised her daughter. When Betty Jo was seven years old, her mother remarried to an insurance salesman named Clark Brown. He was a good addition to the family as far as Betty Jo was concerned and he taught her music and songs on the piano, supporting her love of music. In 1942, while she was age 12, her older brother too passed away, leaving Betty Jo the last link to their original family for her mother. The pair remained exceptionally close, and Bessie kept a scrapbook on all of Betty Jo's school achievements while she played in the school bands. That weekend, she had made some loose plans to meet with her childhood friend, 16-year-old Paul Martin. The pair had grown up together, but Paul had left the Arkansas side of Texarkana aged 11 when his mother Inez moved the family 100 miles south to Kilgore, Texas after the death of her husband. Paul had three older brothers, all of which had joined to serve in the war, but Paul being too young to sign up, settled for attending military school in Mississippi instead. He moved back to Kilgore with his family in 1945. On Friday the 12th of April, the night before Betty Joe's gig at the VFW, Paul left Kilgore High and borrowed his brother's Ford Coupe to drive back north to Texarkana to visit some of his friends. He'd arranged to spend the Friday night with Tom Albritton. The next day, Saturday the 13th of April, Paul made his way over to Betty Jo's house on the Texas side, but found she was out swimming in a lake with some of her friends. He caught up with her mother and stepfather for a while and then arranged to collect Betty Jo after her gig that night at the VFW. 1am rolled around and Paul sat outside the club awaiting the arrival of Betty Jo. She'd been playing in a dance hall since 9pm but the night was over at last and the dancers began to filter out onto the street. Atkins collected the band's fee and distributed it among the players and then drove to an all night restaurant. The band were quite used to socialising after their gigs though Betty Jo would always, without fail, return home first to place her sacks in the safety of her home and let her mother know the night had gone okay. When he met Betty Jo, Paul agreed to drive her home to drop off her sacks, then the pair planned to meet up with some of Betty Jo's friends. Maybe they'd stop in at the all night diner, or maybe at a slumber party one of her friends was holding that weekend. On the way back to Betty Jo's place, Paul suggested parking up near the Spring Lake Park on the northern boundary of Texarkana. It was a quiet rural area in 1946 and the pair parked up around 2am, cutting the engine and sinking the car into the darkness. During the night, Betty Jo's mother woke several times in a panic. Betty Jo had not returned her sacks, and that, she concluded, was far too unusual. Her husband did his best to relax the anxious parent, telling her that she'd probably gone out with friends and not to call them up, to save Betty Jo from embarrassment. Finally, however, Bessie won the argument, and they called Betty Jo's friends, who did nothing to assuage her fears, when they confirmed they hadn't seen Betty Jo since she got into Paul's car after the gig at the VFW. At 6am Sunday morning, a married couple, Mr and Mrs Weaver, saw the body of Paul lying by the roadside, near to Spring Lake Park, and drove to the nearest home to call the sheriff. Sheriff Presley was fortunately a morning kind of guy, and he had been awake and eating breakfast with the Texas side chief of police, Jack Runnels, before his usual Sunday church visit. Both responded to the call over the radio of the discovery of what was thought to be a body out by Spring Lake Park. Upon their arrival, they found the body of Paul Martin lying on the gravel of the North Park Road, on his left side with his legs and feet jutting out into the road. Sheriff Presley confirmed that the body was deceased and he quickly worked to protect the scene to avoid any repeat of the destruction of evidence found at the last scene. Paul had been shot four times, once in the back of the neck, once in the back of his left shoulder, once in his right hand and savagely once in his face. 
They ID'd Paul Martician and quickly via his wallet. Sheriff Presley also found a date book near to his person and he quickly pocketed it. They found blood on the fence on the opposite side of the road and thought that it could have been possible he was shot on that side and then crawled to his position half on and half off the road. They found Paul's brother's Ford coupe parked up with the keys still in the ignition about a mile and a half from his body and about 400 yards from the entrance of the park. Initially, no one knew that Betty Jo had been with Paul, so they didn't extend their search for any other bodies. However, news spread quickly in Texarkana, and as the news of the discovery of Paul slowly filtered back through town, and Betty Jo's friends all confirmed she had last been seen leaving with Paul, the police were notified and the search was organised, comprising of both law officers and local citizens who were happy to assist. Once again the scene had been drawing onlookers, and police drew from this crowd, along with some church friends of Sheriff Presley's, small groups and tried to find any sign of Betty Jo. The Boyds were one such family who joined in the search, and were ultimately the unlucky group to find her body. She was lying on her back about a mile from Paul's body and two miles from the Ford Coop, in a small wooded area 25 yards north of another gravel road named Morris Lane. She was fully clothed, including her overcoat, with one hand in her pocket. She had been shot twice, once in the chest and once in the head. Meanwhile, back at the scene of Paul's body, Sheriff Presley had noticed tracks of a man alongside smaller tracks on the ground and tried in vain to follow them. Officers visited Tom Albritton's house to question him regarding Paul staying at his house that weekend, though he confirmed he had not seen Paul since the day before. Once again, clues at the scene were not forthcoming. From the angle of the gunshots made on the body of Betty Jo, police tracked down, surmised the killer had been right-handed, but otherwise there was once again a lack of any immediate motive. There were no tracks, no clues, no murder weapon. Blanks were being drawn as quickly as new leads were tracked down. To all involved, it seemed as though the killer had simply hunted the pair down for sport, killed them and left after gaining his fill of excitement. It was now that the bubble of quiet building of rumours and gossip in Texarkana finally burst. Panic began to weave its way through the local narrative as people felt threatened by someone who killed with little rhyme or reason. The opinion of 11-year-old Herbert Wren, a young man who had gone up to Spring Lake Park after church school that Sunday morning to see what the fuss was about, was one that echoed throughout the community. It changed our community overnight. Before that, youngsters never felt threatened or uncomfortable anywhere. Now young people were in potential danger, at night, almost anywhere. At 9pm on the players of Betty Jo's band visited the police to tell them everything they had known about the Saturday night, although it seemed like an ordinary night up until they waved off Betty Jo. One important detail they did manage to help the police with was to report that Betty Jo had been with her sacks, an item the police had not found in the car. They supplied the officers with a complete description of the instrument along with its serial number. Police used the information to send out a bulletin to all music and pawn shops in the area to keep an eye out if any instruments matching the description were brought in to be sold. Meanwhile, rumours circulated as quickly as ever. Sexual assault was always one of the first suggestions made in quiet whispers that flooded through Texarkana. Despite Sheriff Presley's insistence to the press that no evidence of sexual assault had been found, the reality was a little more complicated. A leaf had been found inside the coat of Betty Jo, which led some to believe she had removed it at one point or another, and later medical records showed her vagina to have been bruised, along with the FBI's forensic lab report which arrived in Texarkana on April 20th. The report told of the discovery of seminal fluid in her vagina and pubic hair, whilst Paul's penis was found to be free from any evidence of sexual intercourse. There were also four mentions in the Texas Ranger files that she had suffered rape before her death. This all suggested that the killer had assaulted and raped her, though if he had, he had then allowed her to redress before killing her, and for unknown reasons, this fact was being withheld from the public. The same report also confirmed that the same 32 calibre weapon had been used to kill all four victims, along with the discovery of four fingerprints, none of which were the victims, however, they led nowhere. Irregardless, these were facts the public were not privy to, but it didn't stop the rumours from spreading. 
Fear and panic rose quickly with the rumours that a killing spree was underway. This was a crime that differentiated itself from the usual violence known in Texarkana previously. The Miller County Deputy Sheriff Tillman Johnson told of the public's reaction years later in an interview. We were constantly getting calls, mostly at night, about prowlers. People would call about any noise they heard at all. By the evening, the atmosphere had grown tense in Texarkana, but some found hope in a new lease of life given to the level of security when that night, six Texas Rangers came into Texarkana to aid police with the investigation, headed up by Captain Manuel Trezazas, Lone Wolf Gonzalez. Gonzalez was a showman, a handsome ranger who strolled into Texarkana with dual pistols at his hip, each with the handle of pearlescent ivory. He had something of a local reputation, and he was rumoured to have killed over 75 men in his 26 year career with the rangers. He carried a dictionary everywhere he went, and he was a personable character for someone who had reportedly killed so many. He would take the front and centre of the investigation, holding press conferences throughout the investigation. When he arrived, he told one reporter, when asked about his nickname, I guess I got that nickname because I went into a lot of fights by myself, and I came out by myself too. He made good copy for the papers, but quite aside, he also attempted to regain a level of security amongst the locals by telling them that he wouldn't leave Texarkana until the culprit had been captured. Along with the rangers, the Department of Public Safety dispatched technical experts along with a tech lab from Austin. With the bolstered manpower, something which the forces of Texarkana had severely lacked previously, a 100 mile radius was investigated, following any and all leads. One promising statement came from a local man named Ernest Browning, who had seen an old model car drive off from the area of the murders at around 5.30am on Sunday morning after he had heard what he believed to be gunshots. Unfortunately for police, it had been too dark for Browning to catch any details of the driver or his license plates. On Monday morning, the day after the murders, the Texarkana Gazette ran with the headline and lead story. Teenage couple shot to death. Betty Jo Booker, Paul Martin killed in double slaying. Tension gripped city as investigation launched to solve second twin murders. The funerals of the pair were held on Tuesday at Beach Street Baptist Church and were intended by hundreds of locals, all looking to mourn the victims or rub a neck on the hot news item that was, by now, causing so much panic and commotion to the townsfolk. The one thing that was missing was a catchy name for the killer. Press soon put an end to that, however, by devising the moniker that would become the official title as far as reporting would go. On Tuesday afternoon, the front page of the Daily News Evening Edition hit the shelves with the headline, Phantom Killer Eludes Officers as Investigation of Slayings Pressed. The name stuck. The following day, Wednesday the 17th of April, the Texarkana Gazette published its headline, Phantom Slayer Still at Large as Probe Continues. The Phantom, as he was now evocatively known, summed up the crimes well in the imagination of the public. He came from nowhere in the dead of night, carried out his senseless killings and disappeared leaving no trace. It was a name that played well 